Good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. I'm your host today. My name is Matthew Tung. Today, before we bring in a special guest, um, we'll bring you with some news for the day. How are you, Michelle? Hi, Matthew. I'm doing good. How are you? Um, it's late, so I suppose coffee is my best remedy right now. <laughs> so, Spotify recently announced its earnings, missing revenue expectation by 1.23%. However, its monthly active user, they call it MAU, surged from 299 million the previous quarter to 320 million this quarter. Michelle, in your opinion, do you think this was a good quarter for Spotify? Hmm. Um, I don't think I can say for certain whether or not it's good or bad, but I would think that the increase in MAU would be a good thing considering how everyone has turn to home consumption and not really, you know, going outside. And so pay, I'm, I'm sure paid subscription would increase. And I feel like the 1.23% missing revenue isn't too bad. So I would guess COVID kind of did Spotify good in a sense, I would think. What do you think? Yeah, you know, <laughs> see, Spotify has never really released a, a profitable quarter. And that's the biggest problem. So I guess from that perspective, that was a little bit uh, troubling for many investors, for many Wall Street people. But on the other hand, the 320 million um, monthly active users was the one that really jumped out to me. And um, that that increase was what investors are really looking at, especially for like a growth business such as Spotify. This was a really good, at least a good news out of all the bad news that's around, not just to Spotify, but just to the entire, you know, society and just COVID and all that. This is a great news for Spotify. Mm -hmm. So second news that we got here, Kanye, Kanye West. Of course, we got to talk about Kanye. How can we not talk about Kanye West? Kanye West recently spoke on Joe Reagan's show, you know, Joe, Speaking of which, Joe Reagan show, Joe Reagan actually signed with Spotify. So another big hit on what we're going to talk about. Kanye West recently spoke on John Reagan show. I quote, I'm going to buy Universal, as in the Universal Music Group. This is obviously amidst the argument between the record label and the artist over the ownership of the master. Michelle, you know, we all know what type of person Kanye West is. Do you think Kanye is being ridiculous or do you think Universal will be like, yeah, go ahead. Let's get a deal going. Let's see how we can get this pump, this cash in. You know what? Like, honestly, I feel like Kanye is bluffing because then again, he also <laughs> said he was going to run for president and, you know, see what happens. And honestly, how is he going to raise how much of it? Like, I mean, Universal is a $33 billion organization. How is he going to raise that much money, right? So I'm pretty skeptical about that. <laughs> I think he's bluffing. Yeah, he's got it. I mean, if you've got the Kardashians behind you, you, you get to say stuff like this all day, every day. <laughs> Sony. We're going to talk about Sony right now. Sony and TikTok recently struck a deal making all Sony music uh, music available to TikTok. Sony stock hit an all-time high after this news. Michelle, do you think this is a good deal? I would say that this is pretty good for Sony. Like, I mean, what, some of the songs that you hear on TikTok, like what, the Say So? Like, why don't you say so? Like, I think that song is from, yeah, like that song is from Sony, right? So like, a lot of the popular songs rose from that record label. So to some extent, I think it's helping Sony then more than it is for TikTok. And TikTok is just a distribution channel for Sony. So I would say it's a good thing. How do you see it? Well, I do see it that it is good for both sides because Sony is a distributor where, well, no, they're not really a distributor. They're more like a supplier, whereas TikTok is the distributor, yeah. like you said. But, you know, there's one thing that I really wondered that I actually just thought of this question. Do you think that, you know, TikTok being like a 15 second video, do you think that there will be some sort of like maybe dumbing down of like the royalty because they, because TikTok only used 15 seconds or, or, or is, is TikTok going to be like, yeah, we're going to pay you the full royalty fee per song and per use because um, we're good people and we're kind people. Or do you think that, yeah, we should, we, TikTok should be like, 
yeah, we should reconsider this. We're only, we're only using 15 seconds. No, I actually think you brought up a good point because I wonder if they buy, I mean, I mean I'm sure they buy the royalty for the whole song, but um, the longest video that TikTok has is one minute, right? So I wonder if they buy the licensing for the full song. And I think um, when you download a video on TikTok, the song includes in it. So I think um, TikTok signing deals with record labels um, has that royalty issue gone. But then I think for Instagram, for example, because they also have um, songs incorporated into their stories. I think if you download a video, the song doesn't come with it. So I think um, there's a difference that TikTok, you know, kind of has a an edge on. Yeah, I do think that there is, it's not really an edge to either side. I think this is definitely a win-win situation. I definitely wonder how this is going to play on, whether the other other big two, or the, the two of the other big three, um, uh, Warner Chapel, and also um, Universal is going to play along this game. Mm -hmm, for sure. So joining me today is a former media executive, founder of Inside Radio, music business professor at New York University, and currently a journalist at Inside Music Media, Jerry Del Colliano. Hi, Professor. Hi there. Am I allowed to call you Jerry in this podcast? Yes, you can call me anything you want. <laughs> so <Take> my chances. <laughs> so before we get into the topic, I want to know, because you're so outspoken about this, what are your initial reaction? about the results of this 2020 election. Oh, did we have an election? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right, we did, didn't we? This was the long national nightmare. Well, um, let's see how I can do this in a dignified manner. Um, it just is one of the happiest days of my life today. This, is, this gives me the optimum. You know, I think people cannot live without a couple of things. One of them is they can't live without hope. And they can't live without gratitude. They can try, but they're never going to be happy. And today I have an injection of hope um, that we can stop calling each other names. I was raised in a community in Pennsylvania, the state that just happened to push Biden over the top. And it was in one of those suburban communities where he ticked off the, um, the housewives, Republican housewives. And um, I, I lived there. I grew up there. My broadcasting career was in Philadelphia. And you're outnumbered by Republicans, and I was always a Democrat. But we got along. We just differed. And now we live in an era that's so toxic. Toxic not only here in the United States, but toxic in the world. And let me give you one reason I'm, I'm so happy. Because... Yesterday, we had over 125,000 new cases of COVID in the United States. Um, each day, see, on, on Tuesday, election day, it was 104,000. We're headed up to over 200,000 a day. And that great scientist, Dr. Fauci, um, is predicting some really rough times ahead. Now, for you students... And for professors like me who love to be face to face with you and for a music business that thrives when we can do it in person, this is one of the happiest days I can think of because I know we're going to go through some tough months. It's going to be a tough winter and maybe even a tough spring, but somehow I believe on the other side of it all, we are going to have hope for the first time, you know, in Taiwan, well, you can tell me about Taiwan. The number of deaths that you have from COVID is hardly any. The number um, in South Korea, they've done tremendously well. So it does matter what your politics are. And if you have a president that's a denier on climate, denier on everything, and plays to the lowest instinct of any person who's out there just in order to gratify himself, then you get things like we have now, where hundreds of thousands of people die needlessly, or as Joe Biden said last night, an empty seat at the table uh, that will never be replaced. And here we are with some hope this morning, some even a little bit of hope 
that maybe we'll start by taking this pandemic seriously. And let's stop calling it the China virus. Let's stop calling it the plague. Let's st start calling it what it is, which is a pandemic. So you're, you're talking to a happy camper today. I'm telling you, I'll give everybody A's. If I had a class today, I would just say, look, we're going to have no more classes. Everyone gets an A. Thank you. Goodbye. But unfortunately, well, I, by Tuesday, all this will wear off and I'll be back. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you said that you smiled. I wish our listener could see it right now. So yeah. Speaking of the, the light at the end of the tunnel, we can't really say much about the topic that we're going to talk about today, which is about radio and also streaming music, which I know you have a lot to talk about. Now, for, for a lot of listeners, our listeners are, are more, you know, targeted toward the young people. I know I have never really lived the days when radio was really, really dominant. Could you tell us and also our audience a little bit about the history of radio to streaming? Or should I say, like, the downfall of radio? <laughs> All right, let, let's try to make this as painless as possible because you really don't. <laughs> you don't want to see your professor cry because I'm going to... Uh, uh, and I'm going to go back to uh, certainly before my time, because even though it, it may occur to you that I was there at the beginning, uh, that wasn't the case. But, you know, um, a little aside, my, my mother, before she died, she was in a, a nursing facility and they asked me to speak to the people in memory support. And the people in memory support were the people who were having problems with cognitive ability. There were about 40 of them. And I've done a lot of speaking in my life. And I never had an assignment like that. And I said to my wife, I said, I don't know if my career is going up or down right now, but, but they want me to do this. I have no idea what to do. They don't remember anything. So I went in and I talked about radio. <laughs> Guess what? They remembered it. Uh, unfortunately, they thought I was there for it, which I guess I didn't look too good that day. But, you know, it was back in, um, you know, when it started. So let's look at it like this. Radio initially was, uh, you know, a box or, or a device that people sat around because they could hear things that were not where they were. Families sat together in living rooms to be entertained, to be informed, to hear music. Imagine that sitting around. I can't even imagine it sitting around and looking at a radio with no picture and nothing coming out of it but sound. Sounds like a podcast, doesn't it? Well, wait a minute. Let's remember that thought. We'll come back to it. So um, as time went on, um, television was developed. And, and people in radio said, well, television is really radio with pictures. And the radio industry started dying around the 50s when television began to take off. And they had their first rebirth. They became a jukebox. They became format-specific, talk, news, uh, and full-service entertainment. Top 40 rock and roll. And um, so that was, that was a, a, an interesting time that radio reinvented itself and was uh, coincided with television because television, you got to see the pictures and no matter how primitive it was, it was exciting. But radio became something different. And then, believe it or not, that was AM radio. FM radio came along in, in the culture somewhere around the late 60s and somewhere around the time of the Vietnam War, the protests, civil rights movements. And, um, and when it came along, the FM radio stations played music. Guess what they did? They did something so awful. I don't think a professor could even say this without being censored. Music discovery. They had radio stations that didn't repeat. I'm not making this up. They had radio stations that didn't repeat a song all day. Before, before, before you keep going, could you, could you explain to our audience here, what is the difference between AM and FM radio? Okay, it's, it's two different types of, uh, of um, technology. Uh, the AM signal, and I'm not an engineer, but an AM signal is, it travels differently. It uh, travels longer distances, and it uh, winds up hitting uh, certain parts of the atmosphere at night, so it can... It, it can go further. So you could listen to a Cincinnati radio station in Philadelphia, let's say, or a Detroit radio station because it bounces off of the atmosphere. FM has greater fidelity. 
and but it doesn't travel as far. And when FM came along, the thought was, wow, all the music is going to sound better. Think about this for people today who, who have earbuds that are crummy, generally speaking, unless they're spending a lot of money or, or, or listening to music that's compressed, as we do, instead of full fidelity. But FM was, didn't make it on its fidelity. It made it because nobody wanted to listen to an FM station. So people went nuts and they said, well, I got an idea. I'll just not repeat songs. I'll, I'll play what I want. And I'll smoke, you know, uh, joints while I'm doing it. And I'll talk about <laughs> the Vietnam War and I'll be against it. And I'll be for women's rights and I'll be for civil rights and I'll be, I'll really shake it up. And they found out that it went over so big that it was corrupted by advertising dollars because the advertisers said, look at all the audience there. And the transition then went from AM to FM. And for the next couple of decades, FM really represented radio, but the radio companies, uh, um, you know, were very careful to not do too much pioneering until 1996 when the Telecommunications Act of 1996 was passed. That was a Telecommunications Act. Yes, you heard me right. But on the end of the Telecommunications Act was tacked a provision that would allow for the consolidation of radio companies. And what you got from 1996 until now is the long goodbye of the radio industry. Where and what and why exactly is it that like the consolidation brought it to such a demise? Because Wall Street looked at it as a, a way to, to dominate. Now I can go in. Pr prior to that, you could only, um, originally you could own 7 AM, 7 FMs, and 7 TVs stations. Then it was 14, 14, and 14, and then it was a larger number, but it was never hundreds. When there was no, virtually no limit, although there were limits, um, Wall Street said, I'll go in there and I'll dominate. Radio is great. Remember, this is pre um, internet. This is pre Napster. This is pre digital, pre Apple. Okay. So they came in with their money and they would buy these radio stations for a hundred million dollars. And, and these mom and pop owners would get out and get rich and move to Florida and vote for Trump eventually. But um, from 1996 till now, it was the demise of the radio industry that could not be stopped because it was operated by, if I can use some Italian, greedy bastards who really spent their time, um, spent their time trying to get richer at the expense of the medium that they were dominating. And here you have it today, and I write about this in Inside Music Media, I mean, an industry that's dead on arrival, that has no way that it isn't all going to be in bankruptcy, at, a, at the exact time that a whole generation, millennials, grew up without any love of radio. So in short, what you have, and that, there's one more thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up, and that's this. Prior to Apple, prior to Napster, you're with me on this, right, folks? Prior to that, Radio was a linear business. It still is a linear business. One to many. I have one station. I broadcast to many. But we live in a one-to-one -one world. We don't live in a linear world. And radio has no place in our lives. And not only did they give up on their audience when the greedy bastards came in from Wall Street, but something changed. And so the greedy bastards got stuck with these assets and they'll get out and they'll be fine and they'll sell everything off and somebody will get stuck with it. But what's more important is you can't make a linear business, a one-to-one -one business. And we could go on at some point if you want to and talk about user-generated content, which is replacing broadcasting. But I've given you briefly, not maybe not brief enough for you, but a kind of a timeline from the early parts of uh, radio and television came along, when FM came along, 
good times rolled for everybody. And then the Communications Act of 1996, which really was uh, assisted suicide for the radio business. And that's your, that's your history of rock and roll. Yeah, thank you so much, Jerry. Thank I think that's a time. very good overview of how radio turned into, you know, the 20th century and how it kind of died out. And I think Matthew and I didn't really experience a lot of the radio no. era, so that was a lot of learning. Um, actually, you mentioned um, something about linear and user-generated content. That's actually a topic that we wanted to get on because um, in one of your articles titled Spotify, radio dies and on-demand wins. Um, we just wanted to learn more about what are the two distinctions. And as the CEO of Spotify mentioned that in the next 20 years, that is what Spotify is going to be. So could you tell us more about that? Yeah, well, you know, I, I have a great respect for Daniel Eck, and, um, but I, I think he is playing games a little bit. Um, um, I don't think they really know what they're doing over at Spotify. And he admits it, that they're just trying things. And they're embracing podcasting, but why? So they can find another reason to get people to subscribe, pay money for Spotify that he doesn't have to share with the record labels. So, I mean, but having said that, and that's just a little quibble that I have with him, I will say that Spotify has changed everything, everything absolutely everything because it's allowed people to move on from linear to one-to-one -one. see a radio station is not important what's important is a playlist now i'm being basic because there are things that are more important than a playlist it's user generated content and that's where we are now we're actually at that point now and matthew i, I may have said this and maybe i haven't said it in class because it's really tough teaching on zoom but, um, but next semester when I do this course, I'm going to spend a lot more time on user-generated content because I think that the timeline that you folks have kind of forced me to describe today shows as clearly as it could possibly be where we're headed. I was a program director for radio stations. I was on the air. I did all sorts of things, you know, disc jockey, news. I did it all. And then I became program director, decide what music was played. There's no need for a program director. The user wants to be the program director. So we can kind of make that distinction while we talk about radio, because radio decided what you heard. I'll tell you folks, when people went in, I programmed in Philadelphia, not a small city, and if you didn't get on a radio station like mine, your song never got heard. So they come in with payola, you know, try to buy their way on the, on the air or talk you into it or some, so you want to meet the artist, all sorts of stuff. But on my stations, I added one to three new songs a week. So this is your professor not doing music discovery because music discovery wasn't the reason we existed. We existed to play music. And then when we got sick of a couple of things, we dropped them and added a couple of more. We don't live in that world anymore. And the reason we don't is because of Spotify. And, and streaming music services. So Spotify has redefined uh, for a generation how they get their music and, and use their music. And what I think is really significant about this moment in time as we are speaking, Michelle and Matthew, it's that it's morphing even as we speak today into user-generated content. I'll give you some examples. We already know TikTok. We know that we, we want to create our own content. But if I said that you could come back and say, well, yeah, that's great, that's music, and you're a music professor. What if I told you that there's a company called Tegna, T-E-G-N-A, which is a television company, owns, does local news, that they're building their entire franchise around user-generated content. And I worked in television as well, television news. So I used to go out and cover these stories and come back and then you have 45 seconds on the air, make sure you get your picture on camera and 45 seconds. But now it's sent in by users and they like that. So, and, and I'm gonna develop more of this before I get the next semester because you can tell this is a hot button of mine now, but 
we are at, even as we have this podcast today, we are at uh, yet another significant change. We're crossing over from playlists. We're not getting rid of them. We're crossing over and we're entering a new territory. We said, you know, it's wonderful, you know, if, uh, if rap caviar can tell us, you know, what to listen to, or if my favorite hit uh, playlist will tell me what to listen to, or if I can have that chill music when I'm studying, the, the, or can I make my own? Of course I can make my own, but now we're talking about using content in different ways and you, the consumer, are the program director. Can you see how I look at things when you go back to the past, how it was programmed by professionals and why they have such a hard time giving up that power and, and why you are now, you meaning the younger consumer, are now enabled because of things like Spotify. I think I think what you really pointed out here is the the idea of like freedom, right? We we, we there's there's kind of like a PowerPoint. It's just liberty. Is it is it you or is it me? That's and what it is is really it emphasizes the idea. Um, I think it's called interactive media, where that's what Spotify really is. It's an interactive media. I agree. So so there's one thing that you really talked about, and um, you actually talked a lot about this. Um, during class, um, in one of your article, uh, you 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 address that Spotify's declaration of success in the podcasting business is premature and misguided. Now you know me; I love podcasts. So, for those who did not check out our previous episode on Spotify, I'm an um, I'm an avid supporter of Spotify's podcasting. Could you tell our audience and convince me about your skepticism towards a podcasting business? I can tell your audience, but I can't convince you. Uh, <laughs> it's like talking a Trump lover into giving Joe Biden a chance. It's not possible. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't know. What am I on today? Boy, I'll tell you. Too much caffeine, maybe? I don't know. It's one of those days. Uh, but hopefully, to your point, I love podcast, uh, po uh, po podcasting. I just don't like it as a business. And I think it's being portrayed as a business, there is no business model for it. There are a handful of people who are actually making a decent living from podcasting and companies that are embracing podcasting are not doing well. The jury is out on, on Spotify. Are they any better off because of spot, uh, podcasting? I don't think there's any evidence financially or any other way that, that we can see. So if you want to bifurcate the issue, I'll be happy to do it. On one side, Podcasting is a tremendous example of user-generated content. You're able to do what you want. You can have your own podcast. If there's three of us in the United States who want a podcast on Donald Trump's makeup, and there's only three people in the world who want to talk about it, we can find each other on, um, on, on a podcast. And that's a good thing. But can we make money from it? Well, we can't. Because even... Joe Rogan can't. Well, he can make money. But Spotify isn't going to get its return on investment yet. It's a gamble to attract people. And Joe Rogan has become controversial during the election, so it may work the other way with him. You know, we don't know just because it's user-generated, just because anyone can have a podcast, just because we don't have to have the linear broadcasting company develop our content doesn't assure that it's going to be successful. So I see the future of podcasting as being not much of the future in terms of a business. But as far as a cultural phenomenon, yes, I think it will continue to grow and connect people. Um, and you could argue, well, if they're connected, then we have other ways to sell them things or, yeah, you might. And, and that, that argument might be a good one too, but that's my, that's my problem. Uh, too many media companies are trying to portray podcasting as the next thing, and it isn't the next thing from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned that podcasting is bringing people together, and I think 
us three now talking is one of is a really good example of that. Now that we're on the topic of Spotify, I just wanted to ask what were your initial thoughts on Spotify's quarterly report? Any initial reactions? <laughs> Anything that jumped at you? Well, I can't say that I'm shocked that they're not making money. I would be shocked <laughs> if they were making money. Their position is, poor Spotify, we have to pay these uh, artists and we have to pay all this money for the music. Back around the turn of the century, the record industry was in big trouble. And that's how Steve Jobs came along and really conned the, the label execs into, into 99 cent cherry picked music, ruined the album, uh, download on, and, and that's how that happened. But um, Spotify can't make any money. Apple doesn't have to make any money. To Apple, it's nothing. It's, that's not their business. Uh, so Pandora is losing money. I Somebody told me yesterday, and I don't know that I have the figure uh, near me. It's Let me see if I can find it real quickly. Something like, since it's been owned by Liberty Media, they've lost uh, over a billion dollars. Um, I can't find it. Uh, but they, there's no doubt that they have um, done poorly. So that's Pandora. That was the third biggest one uh, of streaming companies. So you've got the streaming companies who are very much a part of the record label's success. Streaming companies are really not making money. Apple doesn't care. Not that they don't care, but it's not going to hurt them. Spotify is trying podcasting, which I think is a joke. Not podcasting. The fact that they're using podcasts to try to to attract people to pay monthly fees, and uh, and Pandora is a is a is a music service that is losing money hand over fist. So we have a crisis coming. I mean, we have something that works great for the record industry and great for the artists. Could be better, um, but. The companies, the streaming companies, are, are, are not quite able to make money. So we have a crisis, whether we want to admit it or not. And I don't think podcasting is is the is the answer there. Uh, we got bigger fish to fry. I mean, you you, you talked about royalty. I mean, uh, I, I've seen the financial report. Um, it was around like seventy percent. That's attributed to um, cost of goods sold, and I've done a little research on what their specific cost of goods sold are, and really it boils it boils down to royalty. And I think from a from a different perspective, I think the the, the bigger reason why they would want to do um, podcasting is also because hey, let's let's see if we can get these jet, um, these content and these listeners away from listening to more music and let them listen to more. Uh, to, to more podcasts so that you know that that turnover rate becomes less so we can pay less royalty and that that gaps becomes much bigger so I was you know I, I think I think there's a there's an argument to why they would do podcasting but I totally I do agree from the from the financial perspective is that ever since they have done podcasting they have never well not never they've been profitable once but they've never really turned it around like 180 and I think a lot of investors are, are, are trying to see that so my, my, my question for you is this, what, what does Spotify have to do or what do they have to do in order to survive from their competitors, especially with these behemoths, like such as Amazon, Alphabet, and then, well, the elephant in the room is really Apple here. Yeah, and, and, I, and you know, Matthew, I don't know, I wish I could tell them that and, and they would get a lot of good free advice. Um, but... I see a million dollar question. <laughs> But I'll tell you some things that I do feel. I, I feel that Spotify is your 
is your shining example of a streaming music service. I think it's the preferred streaming music. They have that going for them. I agree with you, Matthew. I don't think that you can listen to podcast and music at the same time. You may be able to. You may be able to have music in the podcast for moving in that direction legally. Um, but um, it, it appears to me that the the end run around the record labels is not going to work, you, especially among young people. And young people are the ones who who really are important to Spotify. So you're not going to get them to listen to less music and more podcasts. You notice whenever I ask the class how many listen to podcasts, it's never really a huge number. I've never had any of them give me a huge, you know, a lot of them put their hands up. They'd rather have music, listen to music. So I don't know that this philosophy is going to work. But to your question, to your point, which is what could they do? The best thing they have going for them is that they're the most innovative. They're the most preferred uh, streaming music service. Um, I think that they're not going to be um, um, a good investment for someone who wants to make money in their stock because they could be a good business, but they can't be a growth business when you have an expense as high as it is. And you, what are we going to do? Not pay the artists? I mean, they, they would probably go for that. But uh, the, the, that um, genie is out of the bottle. I mean, I don't think it's, we're going back. So they're stuck. Unless they can come up with something else to make somebody else go to Spotify. If the only place you could get TikTok was on Spotify... And you had to have a subscription to Spotify, then they would have successfully um, um, pulled off uh, something else. But they've got to pay rights fees. So I, I don't think that they're. I don't. I don't see it as a growth business. Just as a disclaimer, all my money's in Apple. I uh, I'm I'm a big Apple believer. I've invested in it for the last ten years. Um, I don't buy broadcasting stocks. I don't buy uh, new media stocks. I, I had Netflix for a while and I had Spotify. I sold it. I sold it for the reasons that I'm sharing with you. So do I not like Spotify? No, I love it. I have it. Why not? But is it a business? Yes. Is it a growth business? I don't think so. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. And I just wanted to jump in because, Please. yeah. Um, you also mentioned before that, um, you know, music streaming is just kind of like a side business for Apple. They have bigger things to worry about. So, and I think in one of your articles, you said that Apple is sort of relying on a similar linear radio model versus uh, where Spotify is on the other end of the spectrum. Um, I was just wondering how you would see the competition between these two would play out. I mean, you already stood your ground on how you see Spotify would be in the future. And I just wanted to see what your thoughts were on Apple and their music business. Well, I, I, I'm not sure how linear they are, but I do think that, um, that Apple is a company that's always underestimated, and I've done it, <laughs> even owning its stock. I thought when they went to a music service, this would be the biggest flop you ever saw in your life, and it turned out that in no time, really, they were competitive with um, Spotify, at least in the North America. So Apple has so many more choices than Spotify has because Apple is in our lives all the time. They're everywhere. They're on our phones. They're, and as you're going to see when we, we in a couple of weeks in class when we talk about Apple Glass, which they're developing for 2022, we think, where your every your contents of your phone will be before your eye, augmented reality will be a reality. This is Apple, and Apple. You know, a lot of people don't understand that Apple is not the most innovative company in the world. They just make things intuitive. Like when I go somewhere with my wife, and and, and something is so 
difficult. I always say, God, we need Steve Jobs right now. Let's make this simple. This is overly complex. Think about when you check out of the supermarket. Why is it this complex? It shouldn't be. Um, so I think that Apple, the beauty of Apple is that it's able to take other people's innovation and make it look better, feel better, and more importantly, make it more intuitive and fit into the Apple network community that we all have. We're all connected. You know, before I buy anything other than an Apple device, I have to decide what I want to give up. So, you know, we're stuck. It was PC or Apple back in the day, and now it's Apple or Android. Make up your mind. That's what you're going to probably be. So I don't see them as great innovators, Michelle. I don't see Apple as doing anything particularly exciting in the area of podcasting. Um, I think that there's part of Apple that, and maybe maybe this is what I was trying to get to, that wants to be a little more linear because it's an older, the guy that runs it is older. He's got an older mentality. Generations matter. If you've got somebody running it that sees things from, the perspective of his or her generation, then obviously it's going to have an impact. But um, are they innovative? No, I wouldn't say so, but they make uh, great products. To, to, to interrupt you here, did, I think this really boils down to that one question, right? Is Apple One, like the, the, the service package, really going to flourish? <laughs> like, I, I think that's the, the actual question. No. Is that going to flourish? I, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, now let me ask you two a question if you don't mind does that matter to Apple if it doesn't flourish oh well, I did it I did it I did it I, I stopped you you want to give it a try Michelle I mean honestly as a big tech company, it's really worth nothing great to Apple. So I don't, they're just on the bandwagon. <laughs> yeah. what so, go ahead. Now, what about you, Matthew? We're not letting you off the hook. No, they have too much cash. I, this is this is just a penny yeah. of a dollar. Not even a dollar. It'd be like penny of a hundred dollars. Exactly. Honestly. So, I mean, it, maybe it succeeds. Maybe, you know, like one thing I've learned about trying to see the future is that if I was so smart, uh, I'd be a lot richer and um, and everybody would be hanging on to my every word. And I'm just giving you what I think. If I'm right a little more often than not, I'm happy. So, you don't know. I just told you, I, I called it all wrong with Apple Music, but um, it just seems to me, look, the big thing that's going on right now is user-generated content. Anyone who cooperates with the inevitable, I love that line, cooperate with the inevitable, because the inevitable is inevitable. It's going to happen anyway. And we develop companies that do everything but cooperate with the inevitable. The inevitable is that we want to control our own programming. We want to be our own program directors, if I may use a radio term that we started with. And to that extent, anyone that gives us those tools probably has something worth watching in terms of, I think the term you used, um, uh, Matthew, was flourishing. Uh, I th or, or maybe, Michelle, you used it. If, if, it's, if it's a company that's going to flourish, it's going to have to give us tools to cooperate with the inevitable. And the inevitable is user-generated content. about this company, Liberty Media. Could you first tell us about 
uh, what Liberty Media is and why they're so incredibly powerful. And the second, the biggest question is, what what's their role in this entire streaming slash uh, linear slash whatever music usually generated content war that we're we're seeing here? Hey, Michelle, this has got to be a student of mine to, to understand the importance of liberty, liberty, liberty. Liberty, as the commercial goes. Every time I hear it on TV, I think to myself, John Malone is near 80 years old. He is the founder of Liberty Media. He is the cagey, cheap, um, ruthless um, man who is running uh, this company. That He's putting together, what's odd about it all is he's putting together a media company of essentially traditional media, which we, I think, buried today. We're, we're actually doing a funeral for it today. And he's buying it for pennies on the dollar. So let's go through what he has in mind, because, you know, you're wise to be looking at somebody like this. Back when satellite radio was launched to radio stations, radio companies were really worried. Back in the early 90s, they really worried about satellite radio. If people could pay for uh, digital music, it would sound better, no commercials. But satellite music never killed the radio star. It never really killed radio. Um, what satellite radio did was there were two radio companies. They merged into one. And they still couldn't make a go of it. So the guy who ran the one company, a guy by the name of Mel Carmazan, was either going to bankruptcy or he needed, a, I want to say, three or four hundred million dollars to keep going. And what did he do? He went to a man named John Malone. Yes, that John Malone at Liberty Media. And he borrowed, well, I think it's three to four hundred million dollars. And John Malone got a couple of seats on the board. And guess what happened to Mel Carmazan? He got kicked out. <laughs> and eventually, uh, John Malone took over satellite radio, of which there's only one. There are no competitors now. One. Monopoly. It's a big business. It's got 30 or 40 million, almost not quite 40 million subscribers, paid subscribers, a lot of revenue coming in from non-advertising. But he's bought other things as well. I mean, he's got an interest in Live Nation and he wants to buy more. Um, right now, this would be a great time to buy Live Nation, wouldn't it be? Because it's going to be quite a while before we see live performances again. My own prediction is two to three years. I would be shot in the hallway uh, of the education building at, um, at Steinhardt if I said that. But that's what I believe. If you go back and study the other pandemic, I mean, I mean, I, I we got to get back to live music. But it's not going to happen if we have a virus. So he bought that, and um, he also um, wants to buy. He bought Pandora. Now, Pandora was on the ropes. And what did he do? What he normally does, he comes in and steals the company. So now he's got a satellite radio company. He's got a streaming music company. He's got Stitcher, by the way. He bought that for cash. He's got um, Live Nation, Ticketmaster. Mm -hmm. He wants to buy more of it. What a wonderful time to buy them. And he wants to buy iHeart. Um, so he can have terrestrial radio. But Jerry, you just told me terrestrial radio is over. It's linear. Why would anybody want it? Why? Because he is going to make it an add-on to satellite radio, which is also linear. And he wants to buy a record label. Now, he's tried. He can't. Because the record labels are not on the ropes. They're not cheap. They're going for IPOs, even in the middle of an uh, economy that's iffy now. So, um, so he can dream on, as Aerosmith would say, but he is not going to buy a record label unless he pays a lot of money, which it, he's allergic to doing. 
eventually he'll kind of nibble around the edges and get more involved in the music aspect of it. But you see what he's putting together here? He's putting together a media company that has everything in it from streaming to podcasting to live touring to terrestrial radio and hopefully for him one day uh, a record label. And you should dread that day. You don't want that to happen. That'll be the end of the good times in the record industry. Now, why is he putting all this together? Because he's going to do a thing called programmatic buying, which allows advertisers to go online and say, you know, I'll buy a little Pandora, I'll buy some ads around Omaha, because I can do that with Pandora, I can target it. Uh, I'll buy some satellite radio, and I'll buy some terrestrial radio. And do it all online, you don't need people, doesn't cost any money. That's the company that Liberty Media is putting together. So I ask you, would you be concerned about that if you were going to have a future in the music business? I think that's kind of, that sounds a little bit dangerous, right? They're becoming sort of a monopoly and they're trying to own everything, spanning from radio to streaming to live music. That is really risky. I mean, I would be concerned for, I mean, except for the record labels, but I would certainly be concerned um, yeah, what about you, Matthew? I mean, just the, the, the audacity. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> it, it's a pretty ambitious move, but I would counter the argument. First of all, there are a lot of media companies out there that do dominate and do very well manage, managing, you know, talent and all the media companies. But here's the question. Liberty Media is a losing money business. I mean, I've checked their financial reporting. They haven't had a single year where they have been profitable. Pause. After the time of this recording, I realized I accidentally mixed up Liberty Media's financial data with that of another company. Liberty Media is not losing money at all, and they're a very profitable organization. Now let's continue. So my question is this. Well, how... If, if he how, one is how does he have all these cash while he's losing money and number two why is he doing all this while he's losing money <laughs> well i haven't looked at his financials and i i can't speak to that so i don't know but i guarantee you that he is not hurting and that he is quite able to put these assets together for the promise of what it'll bring and if he's a true entrepreneur let's see he's, he's 80 now so by the time he's 90 he could sell it probably for more than he paid to put it together since he's putting it together, buying it on the cheap. So, but what's more important about it is that we're now living in a world, remember we started with consolidation of radio, but think about what's happening now. We're consolidating all sorts of companies. None of it ever helps an artist. None of it ever helps the audience. It only helps the greedy bastards who invest in it. And that's the truth. So we're, that's America. America is, if you don't mind me channeling AOC and Bernie right now for a second, is the 1% makes all the money. Everyone else is in poverty and there's hardly a middle class. That's America. And it's in the music industry and it's everywhere else. And if you want to see more parity, you're going to have to see a change in what our values are. And as long as Wall Street is, you know, I have to laugh because... The last couple of days, well, we didn't know who the president was going to be. Wall Street's gone through the ceiling. I thought the stock market loves Trump. And now, now Biden's the president. And Wall Street has what we call an alternate reality. And look at the industry we're talking about here. We're talking about the music business and alternate reality. Oh, we're going to be back to we're going to be back to live events next year. I'll make you a bet right now. You want to bet me we won't? <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> so you know we're we're as bad as they are. We have an alternate reality, and you know the, if we wanted to really deal with the truth, the truth is the, the virus, the plague, as uh, the president calls it, um, is not going away. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm sad about that in so many ways. It, it, it's, you don't even know. And when I teach a class of 
great people like I have. I love teaching at NYU and I love my students. And I'll tell you, not to be able to see them ever uh, or be in person and have some excitement together in the same room. No, it's that. And it's also other things too, like um, the reality is that you don't get out of a pandemic because we're tired of it. I'm sorry. So it's going to take some time. So there's an alternate reality, even in the music business, that says, no, 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 I think we're back in late 2021. Yeah. That's funny because when we broke up in, we hunkered down in March of 2020, we all thought we'd be back in the classroom before the end of the semester. We thought live music would be back over the summer. I mean, we just have our head where the sun don't shine. And so there's that. Yeah, and I just had a quick thought about live performances. I think yes. some, I think, I forgot which artist it was. I think it was Steve Aoki. I think they were trying to experiment with a virtual reality concert. And um, yeah, I mean, that's really expensive. There's high barriers to entry. I'm not sure whether or not a lot of artists are going to go with that way. And certainly, I don't know if that's going to be the new normal, but that's not going to replace any live performance. So I find that really interesting. I don't know if virtual reality would actually solve any issues right now. It's interesting you bring it up, Michelle, because uh, in uh, Matthew's uh, music and media class, I'm bringing in a friend of mine from UCLA who is going to demonstrate exactly what you're talking about, how virtual reality can be used for now as a substitute uh, for live events. So we'll actually see it. Uh, and if you like and you're available and want to join it, Matthew can give you a link and I, I'd be happy to have you as a guest uh, because I think you, you brought it up. I think you'd be very, very interested in it. Now, listen, let's try to keep it real. Virtual reality is, is actually has already begun to, um, to, to produce dividends. Now, let me explain. Um, we're able now to do things um, not live, let's put it like that, that um, show us parts of the artist's lives and how they go about their work in ways that we didn't see before. And people seem to like, like that. That becomes um, a function of our ability to spend time with them in a digital way. However, it, we still can't enjoy a live performance. So I just want to throw a couple of things out to you and don't ask me for answers because I don't have any of them. I'm one of these sneaky professors that just has questions. Like for example, if you're 12 years old and if you believe your professor who says four years from now, we'll probably be returning to full-time live events. That means Mick Jagger will be a, over 80 and he's the number one touring artist uh, the, the stones are um all right let's say four years from now will he be then will uh, everyone come back if you're 12 years old if you are will you come back to something that you never got involved in in the first place but you found a replacement in virtual reality i don't know the answer to that and is it possible that, um, that the relationship between, oh, is it possible that the, the people who are making all their money touring right now, which largely are baby boomer um, acts and, and arguably some Gen X, basically older, not uh, hip hop as much, is that... What's going to happen? In other words, let's let's go into uh, since it's Donald Trump's day today. Let's go into uh, an alternate reality and say, uh, you know what's going to happen in four years? We hit the pause button and we unpause it, and we just pick up where we left off. Isn't that wonderful? Because I'm here to tell you, I don't think it's going to be that way at all. In fact, this is why. You should be happy because everything is going to be disrupted and it's on your watch. All the startups, 
all the new companies, all the answers to an audience that has changed. We've finally gotten rid of baby boomers. God, Professor Miller hears me say this, he'll say, oh my God, don't get rid of all the baby boomers. But no, I'm just saying, Mick Jagger and the Stones, this is your top revenue producing live act prior to this everything breaking down. So what happens when we come back? It's all going to be different. And it's great opportunity for young people in this business. If they understand that we're not just going to hit pause and then restart again. We're going to start from a new place. That 12-year-old I started with is not going to be the way a 16-year-old would be a number of years later. They're going to be completely different. And one way we can see already, because they're going digitally, they're getting more and more involved with the artists. And you can make an argument, well, um, you know, the uh, K-pop acts, uh, you know, BTS, they're making money. Yeah, they're $20 million. Yes, I'm not taking anything away from it. I'm just saying it's not likely to be replicated at that level. Uh, and we should celebrate it because this <laughs> is, the bad part is that we can't see each other. We can't be with each other. We can't enjoy our work together. We can't entertain each other. But the good news is, is that we're finally breaking with baby boomers. We're breaking with the past that has controlled everything. And now it's on your watch. What are you going to do with it? I love how you were already jumping ahead because our, actually our next question was about going to be about the future. But since you brought up um, uh, uh, the whole idea of virtual reality and um, augmented reality, I really want to talk about just how, how do you think your prospect about the future of how music distribution is going to be? And especially for, for these large players, not just, you know, not just Spotify, but also the virtual reality. How, how do you think it's going to play out in the future for, for these music distribution companies? Okay, I'll tell you one thing that, that and now I'm being real, I, I'm not in my own alternate reality, although you may accuse me of being there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, I don't think you're going to ever get rid of the record labels. Uh, I don't think it's in the best interest of the music industry to get rid of them. And I'm not saying they're perfect. Believe me, I've had my arguments with them over the years. But um, no, I think you're going to have... Uh, I, I never believed in the long tail. You're familiar with the long tail. Where, right? and, um, but I do think that the industry is driven by major companies that make major investments in artists. I think you're going to see fairer deals for artists. You're not asking me this question, but I'm throwing it in. I think artists will own some of their work. Uh, maybe not all of it, but that's a change. And I don't see this business moving on uh, where it's so democratic that it bubbles up from the bottom and becomes a thriving industry. I think what you're going to see is more of what we have now, whereas anyone can be discovered at any given time. But if you want to have a big career, you need to be have an advocate. And right now, the advocate that I can see is the record label. Before we move on to our favorite segment, Michelle, do you have any questions? Um, okay. that's not really a question, but just a comment. Got me thinking how, yeah, everything's become so common and democratic nowadays. Like, I mean, you see all these TikTok stars just rising out of nowhere, right? But in the long run, they have to be backed up by some sort of record label. So I completely agree with that. Um, yeah, I think for each of our podcast episodes, we end with a music of the week. So... Jerry, would you want to start us off with what kind of music you're up to this week? <laughs> and just before you pick one, usually you're going to have a very hard question, not really. You're going to have a really strange question that I'm going to hit you with. Well, I, you know, I hate when people ask me about music. I love all kinds of music. And I was thinking that if I could only listen to five or ten things ever, what would I pick? And I know I couldn't do it, but I'm going to fool you because um, today is such a special day for all of you. <laughs> I'm not going to, this song is not uh, a hip hop song. It is not, and you know, I get accused of being a, 
I'm not a musician. I am a top 40 radio program director and disc jockey. So I like any hits channel that you have. But today, in deference to the national holiday that it is, I'm going to suggest, uh, I don't even know whose version of it it would be, but I'm going to suggest the song back from way before my time and Professor Miller's time and anybody working at uh, as faculty at NYU, I would say Happy Days Are Here Again, which is a song that used to be played by the Democrats at their conventions and when they won their elections. And you're going to make me go find a version of it at some point and just uh, ask Alexa to play it all day long. But I don't even want to categorize genre or anything because this is what the beauty of music is. is it's everything and it's anything. It's got the potential to be something, or it could be nothing. It could come and disappear, but it served its purpose. And, and that's, you know, and, and you're talking to a guy who makes hits, who program hit stations, who wants to get ratings and wants to play the hits. And that's what I'm always criticized for. You know, what kind of musician are you? Well, I'm not a musician. I'm a program director. I make the hits. So happy days are here again. So speaking of happiness, what is going to make your day happier than this? <laughs> I don't think, I don't, I really don't. <laughs> All right, maybe, Michelle. Maybe, maybe, maybe if AOC declares she's running in 2024, that would make me happy because I do, would like to see the country move in that direction where we have more social justice and where we have people taken care of that our government exists. To, to make lives better for people, where we can have um, people who live in poverty that don't get prenatal care can actually have children without us having to have a debate about whether we're giving welfare to them. Can we take care of the babies? Can we educate people? You know, I'm a flaming liberal, but you know, today I'm going to put all of that aside and I'm going to say, thank God something good happened where maybe, maybe, at least for a period of time, we can live up to the potential that we have in this country and differ, but love each other along the way. Okay, so, Michelle, what's your music of the week, then? I just wanted to say, as, as Jerry was saying this whole time, was speaking this whole time, sorry, I was cackling in the back with my, with my microphone <laughs> muted. Anyway, um, I don't have any song in particular, but... Um, I'm kind of a basic, you know, listen, when I listen to the top 40 songs as well, but um, sometimes I just discover new music with the Spotify playlist as we were talking about, you know, putting in the user generated content mentality there. Um, I've been listening to this playlist called Chill Hits. Uh, it's created by Spotify and some of their artists are Brockhampton, Low, um, Emotional Oranges, etc. And it's just a place that I listen to at the end of the day to rewind, etc. Definitely a place that I would recommend, which mm. kind of ties into what we've talked about today. And what about yourself, Matthew? So my song, I'm gonna have to go with what uh, how how Jerry is feeling here. I'm gonna go with "Party in the USA" by Miley Cyrus because. <laughs> Because I don't know if every American feels this way. We're not a political channel, but mm -hmm. this is how exactly how I and my friends feel. It's a party in the USA. Because and you know what? Blues are coming. I just got I just got a an idea. Maybe I'll change mine to "It's All About the Bass." <laughs> <laughs> Boy, am I going to enjoy that song and read whatever I want into it now because I just need. To... It's a good jam. Oh, I'm such a, I'm such a top 40 it's guy. It's okay. about that face. No trouble. Oh, <laughs> okay, so that will do it for today, our audience. Um, so I got Jerry, and this is such a wonderful podcast. I, I wish I could bring you on more, honestly, Jerry. Well, I'm always available, but I, I probably told you everything I know, and that's the end of the <laughs> Everyone's good for about an hour, and then beyond that, they have nothing. They just repeat everything and make it up. Uh, but um, when we get the podcast together, let me get the link for it. I'll, you know what I might do? I might even put it up on Inside Music Media and have some of these 
uh, folks in the industry um, uh, listen to what reality looks like from the way we talk about it in, you know, in our classroom. And Michelle, I mean it. If you want to come to our class and see that session, it's on uh, Matthew Immersive Technology. When we get to that session. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I would be honored to join. Uh, it would be a pleasure to see you again. So, how, how can our listeners uh, reach you? Well, you can call. You can uh, contact me by email if you want to. J. Delcaliano at uh, mac dot com, and um, or you can get my social media stuff and put it up there. But uh, I would love to um, hear from anyone who agrees, disagrees, or who can just bring. You know some interesting thoughts. After all, isn't that what we try to do in class? Where, you know, I know that it's supposed to be that you, you go to class and you learn everything the way the professor wants you to learn it. We'll test you on it to make sure you know it. But every time I finish a class, I come back and I rip the thing up and I put everything start over again because <laughs> because something happened. You know, students don't want you to have four or five weeks off. They want to give you so much to think about that you say, you know, maybe I should be doing this differently. And that's what makes it fun. You know? it, it really does. So let's see what happens. And but I mean, uh, your questions were were stimulating, and I think that's why uh, we were able to go where we went because I think you were really focused in, in places that matter. I mean, how would we get to? Um, you you went back to the beginning when we had basic communication, but now we've taken it all the way to where we are today, where we're not even sure of what. Things are going to look like, and yet we're speculating. How, how much fun is it to be in this business? I well, for for our listeners who, who don't know, you should definitely check out Inside the Music Media. the The website is absolutely awesome. Actually, a lot of my insights I get from there. So, for listeners who don't uh, who don't have it, go there. And that will be that'll do it for the day. Thank you, um, and bye bye. Thank you very much. Take care, Michelle. Take care, Matthew. Thank you. We also want to thank Matt Klein for writing our awesome jingle for Surround Sound. Thanks, Matt.